There are multiple historical references to combat medicine and noted evolutionary milestones. This video will cover only some key points as a general overview. There are unsighted references that Alexander the Great was the first combat commander to advocate the use of tourniquets based on the works of medical researchers on the island of Kos, Greece, likely by Hippocrates and others. The Romans are credited for many early surgical tools and procedures. However, battlefield medicine may have been one of their most valuable contributions. Under the leadership of Augustus, the Romans established a military medical corps. This is one of the first known dedicated field surgery units. There are historical references that they use tourniquets and arterial surgical clamps to treat combat wounds. Though the concept of medicine would have had a very different context in this era as it was technically in its infancy. While based on a mythological story, the drinking cup of Potter Sosius depicts Achilles bandaging Patrocles, which is one of the earliest known pictorial references to battlefield medicine. Very little improvements would be made for centuries. Jumping far forward in time, the Spanish are credited with dedicated carriages for wounded during the Siege of Malaga in 1487, though this was likely more of a logistics means than actual casualty transport to care. In 1517, Hans von Gersdorf published the Field Manual for the Treatment of Wounds with an illustration of the various types of combat injuries. In the same century, French military surgeon Ambrose Paré pioneered modern battlefield wound treatment with the use of bandaging and ligature to stem bleeding. The practice of triage was pioneered by Dominic Jean Larey during the Napoleonic Wars of the early 1800s. He also began using ambulances to evacuate wounded prior to cessation of combat. This evacuation, however, was now likely to ambulate casualties for emergent treatment. Russian surgeon Nikolai Ivanovich Pirogov was one of the first surgeons to use ether as an anesthetic in 1847, including the very first surgeon to use anesthesia in a field operation during the Crimean War. In 1862, during the American Civil War, Major Jonathan Letterman was named medical director of the Army of the Potomac. Over the next two years, he championed a series of innovations, including a system for evacuating and treating casualties. Letterman envisioned a group of regular soldiers trained to swiftly evacuate wounded soldiers from the battlefield under the supervision of a chain of command. His plan would evolve into a network of field hospitals that delivered necessary treatment of wounded, ill, and injured soldiers behind the lines. He also devised a system to document treatments and outcomes so he could continuously improve care. Also during the American Civil War, it is worth mentioning the well-known story of General Albert Sidney Johnston, who was wounded in the leg and bled to death, ironically with a tourniquet in his pocket. Advances in surgery occurred, especially treating amputations, during the Napoleonic Wars, American Civil War, and the First World War particularly at the Battle of Somme. During the Spanish Civil War that preceded World War II, there were two major advances. The first one was the invention of a practical method of transporting blood. The second advance was the invention of the mobile operating room. In World War I, building on 19th century experience treating extremity injuries and new data on the spread of germs from contaminated wounds, Military trauma surgeons began to make more informed judgments about when to immediately amputate a badly fractured arm or leg and when to defer the decision until the casualty reached a higher level of care. This would be the first indications of the development of damage control approach. In 1916, the American Red Cross published a poster stating that, quote, each stretcher bearer, each officer, each man if possible, should know how to fix a garrote. The use of the garrote has been much criticized, but if it causes the loss of a limb, it may save a life. Many men die unnecessarily from hemorrhage on the battlefield and at the ambulance.
World War II produced numerous advances, including the introduction of sulfa and penicillin, giving military doctors the ability to better fight infections. Surgeons began to consider blood replacement to treat hemorrhage and shock. The concept of positive pressure respiration therapy was developed to deal with wet lung syndrome, a dangerous buildup of fluid in the lungs following chest surgery. Military doctors also began to recognize the value of physiological monitoring of casualties. World War II would also bring the establishment of fully equipped mobile army surgical hospitals, or MASH units, and the deployment of medics integrated within infantry units. The use of helicopters as ambulances, or medevacs, was first practiced in Burma in 1944. The first medevac under fire was conducted in Manila in 1945, where over 70 troops were extracted in five helicopters, one and two at a time. Korea and then Vietnam conflicts would see further evolution in the use of helicopters as medevac platforms. The green feet symbol used by U.S. pararescue men and other combat search and rescue personnel originates from what looked like a large footprint in the Vietnam grass when the H-3 helicopter would land. The jolly green giant feet would come to symbolize the rescue of casualties. Though progress was slowly being made, many lessons learned in conflicts were not persisting. In Vietnam, there was no advocacy for tourniquet use. The lessons learned of its importance in previous conflicts have been lost to time and attrition. As such, it is estimated by deriving the number from a cohort of casualty data that approximately 2,500 U.S. soldiers may have died from isolated extremity injuries in that conflict. All preventable had tourniquets been issued and trained on. On October 3rd, 1993, the Battle of Mogadishu occurred, depicted in the famous movie Black Hawk Down. This event would be the catalyst for major change in the U.S. Special Operations community in the way casualties are treated on the battlefield. To this point, military medics were taught civilian-based paramedicine and expected to apply it in a very different environment than which it was intended for. Medics were expected to essentially figure out how to modify domestic civilian pre-hospital medical practices so that they were functional during combat. Shortly after the Battle of Mogadishu, the U.S. Naval Special Warfare Command Biomedical Research and Development Office established a formal requirement to review the management of combat trauma in the special operations environments and make recommendations for changes as appropriate. Admiral Ray Smith started the process with significant literature review and workshops across the country with all relevant stakeholders. Informal training began almost immediately in the special operations community, often referring to this new style approach as ditch medicine. Colonel Ronald Bellamy authored Chapter 1, Combat Trauma Overview in the 1995 edition of Anesthesia and Preoperative Care of the Combat Casualty. His well-researched statistical data would lay the foundation for which Tactical Combat Casualty Care, or TCCC, would be established on. Then, in August of 1996, the result of three years of work was published in a supplement to military medicine authored by Navy Captain Frank Butler called Tactical Combat Casualty Care in Special Operations. It included a paradigm shift defining phases of care in a tactical environment, advocating tourniquets first rather than as a last resort, and the concept of permissive hypotensive fluid resuscitation strategies, among other epidemiologically driven guidelines. Much of it was considered controversial at the time. It was first formally implemented by Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, and Air Force pararescuemen in 1997. Informally, it was being used since as early as 1993. In 1999, Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support, or PHTLS, began to publish TCCC updates in its curriculum manual. The guidelines received the American College of Surgeons and the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians endorsements. In 2001, the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, also known as the COTC, was started as a means to keep the TCCC guidelines up to date. The committee continues to sit and updates the guidelines to this day.
Implementation continues to saturate the U.S. military and quickly evolved out of the special operations community into the conventional forces, other government agencies, allied nations, and the civilian law enforcement sectors. In retrospect, the concepts and equipment evolution that TCCC has spurred has made a bigger impact of combat casualty survival rates than anything ever before in history. In Butler et al.'s paper entitled Battlefield Trauma Care Then and Now, A Decade of Tactical Combat Casualty Care, published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, the paper opens as follows. Mahone reported in 1970 that 193 of a cohort of 2,600 casualties that were killed in action in Vietnam died of isolated extremity hemorrhage. The percentage of fatalities that resulted from exsanguination from extremity wounds was 7.9%. This was the leading cause of preventable death among U.S. military casualties in the Vietnam War. Mahone commented at the time that little progress had been made in battlefield trauma care in the last 100 years. A sobering postscript to Mahone's observations in 1970 is found in the preventable death analysis done by Holcomb et al. and Kelly et al. in the current conflicts. Holcomb et al. found a 15% incidence of potentially preventable fatalities in his article that reviewed all special operations deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan from the initiation of hostilities until November 2004. He found that 25% or 3 of 12 fatalities with potentially survivable injuries might have been saved by the simple application of a tourniquet. The larger causes of death analysis by Kelly et al studied 982 fatalities from the first five years of the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. He documented that 77 of 232 potentially preventable deaths from the Armed Forces Medical Examiner records resulted from failure to use a tourniquet. Exsanguination from isolated extremity wounds thus caused 7.8% of the combat-related deaths reported in the article of Kelly et al. The failure to make progress in addressing the leading cause of the preventable deaths on the battlefield in the 30 years between the Vietnam and Afghanistan wars, despite the ready availability of the requisite technology, dramatically underscores Mahone's point about the lack of progress in battlefield trauma care. The decade of conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan has, however, seen sweeping changes in the pre-hospital care of combat casualties. After a detailed analysis and explanation of the successful evolution of battlefield medicine, the paper concludes that the two primary reasons for the significant success in such a short period of time is the longest sustained combat operations in U.S. history and the creation of the COTC. It goes on to say, with the advancements on hospital care and evacuation techniques, as well as development of the joint trauma system, the U.S. military and its coalition partners now have the best definitive care and evacuation capabilities for the management of combat trauma in history. The ongoing role of TCCC is to make sure that our casualties get to the hospital alive so that they can benefit from it. Taken as a whole, the innovations described previously represent a complete revamp in battlefield trauma care. TCCC has helped combat units to achieve unprecedented casualty survival rates when those units train all their combatant personnel in these techniques. The price in lives that we have paid to recognize the need for TCCC and to affect its transition has been high. Both TCCC training and the COTC need to be sustained in peacetime so that we do not pay this price again in the next conflict. In John Craig et al.'s paper, published in the Journal of Special Operations Medicine, Fall 2013 edition, he writes, Initially, in these wars, tourniquets were used rarely or were used as a means of last resort. And then goes on to say, Eventually, refined care was shown to improve survival rates. From all medical interventions evidenced in the current wars, the tourniquet broke rank and moved to the forefront as the pre-hospital medical breakthrough of the war. While the tourniquet takes first prize, there have been significant advances in the combat medical treatment doctrine and technologies. 
Updates to the COTSI guidelines are at times quarterly, and allied nations such as Canada have created their own versions of guidelines to correlate with their own doctrine and equipment. Advances have been made in treatment strategies such as fluid resuscitation, which is now well on its way to damage control approach with blood products and hemostatic drugs being pushed far forward. Hemostatic dressings and junctional tourniquets were also worth mentioning as significant improvements in recent times. If necessity is the mother of invention, war necessitates improvements in casualty care. As war changes, so will the way casualties are treated, including the technology and techniques used. This video only scratches the surface of the history of battlefield medicine, but hopefully has provided you with an understanding of where we have come from to get to where we are. This concludes the History of Battlefield Medicine video. Thank you for watching.